Yes, and our chair is Henny Edmoni, who you saw yesterday. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Um, you're in for a really great session of four long talks. Um, our first talk will be by Bao and Wen, and it's titled, You Only Demonstrate Once, Category Level Manipulation from Single Visual Demonstration. OK, hello, everyone. I'm Bowen. I'm glad to present our paper, You Only Demonstrate Once, Category Level Manipulation from Single Visual Demonstration. This is a joint work with Wen Zhaolian, Costas Backwards, and Stephen Shaw. Well, I was doing the internship with, uh, with Intrinsic, formerly known as Google X. So as humans, we are able to watch the demonstra demonstration once and uh, immediately generalize the task to various instances. We are interested in answering this question in this work. Can we teach the robot similar to human-to-human -human apprenticeship? That is, category-level manipulation from single visual demonstration. To do so, there are multiple challenges. First, we need to generalize with high data efficiency. When only one demonstration is given, we need to generalize to various instances, backgrounds, and configurations. We also consider multiple challenging tasks in this work. For example, the video shown on the right, for the battery assembly, there could be large dynamics due to the rich context, a lot of dynamic uncertainties. Also, for the gear insertion, it requires high precision. And also, for the battery assembly, the critical sequential action is required to put the battery into the, uh, beside the spring. For the related work, KPAM achieved promising results on category-level manipulation. It uses key points representations. Another related topic is visual imitation learning which is uh, the representative work GTI is able to learn long horizon rearrangement manipulation and can generalize to new tasks on the same set of objects. However, both of them have some limitations that prevent them to achieve the intelligence level of human-to-human -human apprenticeship. In contrast, we overcome some of the limitations. So, for example, we reduce the demonstration to only one. Also, we tackle some of the very challenging tasks that involves dynamic uncertainties and high precision. We also remove the, uh, the requirement of human annotation of the key points. To clarify more about our problem, during the training phase, we assume access to the object CAD models in the same category. We also were also given one demonstration RGBD video. During the testing phase, our goal is to execute the task on the novel unseen object instance in the same category. We formalize this problem as category level behavior cloning. That is, we first extract the trajectory from the single visual demonstration, and then we generalize this, generalize this trajectory to, to the novel unknown instances to follow. Here's our approach overview. It can be divided into three parts. First, offline Nunox learning learns a category level representat uh, representation. The Nunox is a abbreviation of non-uniform normalized object coordinate space. It learns how to associate different instances in the ca same canonical space of a category. The second is the demonstration video parsing. We use a 60 post tracker, which it doesn't require our instance or category level models to extract the motions from the single visual demonstration. And then we convert this trajectory into a category level canonical space using the Nunox representation. And during the online testing stage, we, our goal is to take the object and closely follow the trajectory using closed loop feedback from the visual tracker. Let's first take a look at the offline Nunox learning. We use a neural network to learn this representation. Our goal is to associate between the training instances with the novel unseen instance. During the training stage, we put the training instances into the simulation and generate large-scale synthetic training data with domain randomizations. The network is only trained on the synthetic data and later will be directly applied to the real world for the novel unseen instance. Let's take a closer look about the Nunox net. It takes as input the partially scanned point cloud and predict the proponent canonical location. 
During the training stage, the supervision is the cross-entropy loss over the discretized coordinate space between the canonical point cloud against the ground truth from simulation. During the testing stage, given the predicted point cloud in the canonical space, we can compute two byproducts. First, we can get the 90 poles, and second, we can get the dense correspondence between different instances within a category. Once we have the 90 poles and dense correspondence, we are getting prepared to transfer the trajectory from one instance to another. We just talked about offline Linux learning. Now let's take a look at the how do we transfer the trajectory to a novel on instance. Here we show the comparison of using different methods to transfer from the demonstration trajectory to the novel on instance. Linux only will simply align based on your object centers. KPAM 2.0 will align based on the human annotated key points and their orientations. Our method combines Linux learning with dynamic attention. That allows to dynamically change the anchoring coordinate frame. And as the battery travels along the trajectory, we can see that at the later stage of the trajectory, it is able to attain to both the spring and the bottom plate to avoid collision. And know that this process is fully automatic, just using the demonstration without any human annotation. But how do we get this attention heat map? During the demonstration, we know the complete shapes of the training objects and the receptacle. So we are able to get an implicit sign distance field of the receptacle and then look up the sign distance values of the objects. Intuitively, the nearest group of points and the contact points are the most ta task relevant. So we can derive a heat map based on their sign distance values. During the testing stage, however, we no longer have the shapes because there are no unseen instance. So we cannot directly repeat this process. Instead, we choose to transfer the heat map using the dense correspondence obtained with Nunox. We just uh, talked about transferring the trajectory. Now let's take a look at the tracker. Because we want to apply the tracker to the novel unseen instance, we adopted our previous method, bundle track, which does not rely on instance or category level 3D models. The tracker is used for two purposes. During the offline, we, we parse the video demonstration and extract the motions. And during the online execution, the visual tracker will provide visual feedback for the closed loop control. We conduct experiments over two categories, the gears and the batteries. Note that the testing splits are the real products purchased from the retailers to, resem to resemble the real world scenario. We also consider three tasks, the battery standing task, battery assembly task, and the gear assembly task. Here shows one qualitative example on the battery assembly task. On the corner of the videos, we show the visualization of the tracker and the Nunox color embedding, which indicates the dense correspondence between the two different batteries. We first extract motions using the tracker from the single demonstration and then transfer it to the novel unknown instance to follow. Note that this is a very challenging task because the intermediate action also matters. If you only provide the goal specification, it is not possible to achieve this task. Also, at different timestamps, very specific orientations and positions of the battery is desired. However, thanks to the imitation, where the robot is able to quickly learn this complicated manipulation skill. What's even better is that it, the robot is also able to generalize, generalize this complicated skill to various unseen batteries. All the batteries have not been seen during the training, and these are zero short transfer from the same canonical trajectory. Oh, sorry, it gets freed. Sorry about that. Okay, to continue, here's another example on the gear insertion task where the high precision is desired. Here, the video shows the 0.1 millimeter tolerance between the gear and the shaft. Again, we are able to achieve this task by transferring the trajectory. Here's uh, more examples on different gears. And again, they are all zero short transfer to the novel unseen gears. And they are all transferred from the same canonical trajectory using the single visual demonstration. We conducted comparison methods with different baseline methods, including KPAM, KPAM 2.0, and DON. 
And the point is that we are only the one that trains on the synthetic data, and also we remove the requirement of human annotation. Here's a task success rate comparison over the baseline methods. In total, we conducted over 1,500 experimental trials. For the gear insertion task, we conducted three different levels to investigate the, total, the boundary of each method. And notably, we are able to outperform the baseline methods by a large margin. For the very tight tolerance regime in the gear insertion and battery assembly, the original baseline method is not able to succeed. And also for the commonly considered pick and place tasks, such as the battery standing, we're able to easily achieve 100% reliably. Here, next I will introduce more additional study. Due to the closed loop, our system is robust against external disturbance. Here, even if I'm dragging the gear and change the gears in hand pose, the robot is able to know this and adjust to it, which still results in a success. Previously, we have shown the naive top-down strategy for the gear insertion. There is another smarter strategy that is anchor and pivot. However, while it reduces the expectation on the precision, it introduces more complex intermediate actions. Again, thanks to the imitation, the robot is able to learn this complicated skill and generalize to different instances. We also have limitations and failure modes. On the left, one common failure is that when the robot is doing the anchor and pivot, due to the rich contacts, the gear's pose changed significantly, and the robot arm wants to lift more to adjust, but due to the joint lim limits, it's not able to continue. On the right, due to the strong spring force, the battery is ejected, and uh, this is because we don't have the tactile to detect this beforehand. In the future, it will be more interesting to integrate with in-hand manipulation and tactile sensing. To summarize, we propose the category-level manipulation from single visual demonstration framework. By just using one demonstration, we are able to generalize to various instances, backgrounds, configurations, and external disturbances. It is also robust due to the closed loop, and this only requires training in the simulation. Finally, we unlock some, ma uh, some challenging manipulation skill, such as gear insertion and battery assembly, where the original baseline metal can only achieve zero success rate. Thank you for your attention, and uh, welcome to my poster session. Questions? I see a question over there. Yeah. Can I? Okay, hello, thanks, thanks for the fantastic presentation. Uh, I wonder what are the assumptions that we make for different objects to be in the same category? And also, given a new category of objects, how should the new NOx uh, coordinate frame be decided? Uh, so for the first question, uh, let me repeat. Your question is, uh, how do we uh, identify different objects within a category? Uh, yeah, or like, let's say, given a bunch of different screws or different new parts, uh, in what, uh, what are the rule of thumb that we should decide whether they belong to the same category or different categories? Yeah, for this, we follow the definition of uh, previous work, such as KPAM and two, KPAM 2.0. That is the objects that's under the same name and they are, uh, they are used for same task purpose. They have the same uh, geometry structure the, in the general. And, uh, so we follow that definition. And uh, I, I agree that um, there is so far not a, a way to, a metric to quantify, quantitatively quantify this uh, the similarity between the different instances, which maybe require some common sense. And I believe that will be very interesting work to quantify how do we measure the similarity of different objects within a category. Uh, thanks. Also, uh, let's say given new category, uh, does the specific definition of the new NOx matter? Uh, or like it actually doesn't matter and the attention module will take care of it? Uh, yeah, so, so the, here the new NOx is a canonical space because here we are working on the industrial objects such as the batteries and the, the gears. When they are designed, when they are CAD designed, they are following the same stand, uh, industrial standard. For example, the gears are, the, the Z-axis are always per perpendicular to their plan. And uh, when we can directly then we, then we can directly process over these CAD models during the training, and the NUNOX is just their canonical space. Uh, does, is this assumption about which axis is the gear, uh, like actually is used uh, for the algorithm, or it is aut uh, learned automatically? Uh, the canonical spaces can be arbitrarily uh, defined. That depends on uh, your category. For example, for the gears, um, the gears, the canonical space maybe make, makes more sense to make the Z-axis perpendicular to the uh, 
plane, or you can use x, y axis. For the, for the objects such as the bottles, you can also use uh, uh, the axis or the cups. So you can, the, the bottom line is that all the instances you have to follow the same uh, canonical definition. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry about taking so much time. Uh, no problem. Um, yeah, great talk. I have a related question to the last one. So how, how do you decide what parts of the object to align to each other? So if you have like objects of different lengths, should you align the tops or the bottoms or how do you decide? Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe let me go back to the, to the slide. Yeah, so this, this is exactly the uh, problem we are considering. So for example, when, when there are two batteries and one is longer, one is shorter, uh, to finish the task, the battery has to first press the spring on one end. If you are simply using the Nunox, that will only basically uh, very simply align based on their centers. So the longer battery may first, uh, may, may, may just collide with the spring because it will not figure out first the contact of the spring. But in our case, we, because we are using the attention heat map, we based, we compute the attention heat map and then align the different shapes using their local, the local parts. Because the one limitation of 60 poles is that um, the coordinate frame is fixed and it's not very flexible to different local parts on the objects. Great. Um, let's take one last question as we switch speakers. Go ahead. Yeah, great talk. Um, quick question to clarify. You said in your future work, uh, in-hand manipulation, is that, would that also involve making and breaking contact? even with just an antipodal gripper? Uh, sorry, your question is, uh, would it be helpful to consider contacts? Yeah, well, actually, I, I just wonder what you mean by in-hand manipulation. Oh, yeah. So, for example, on the left side, because the, the, the gears pose, the orientation also changed in hand. So, the, and the, the tracker notifies the robot that it needs to lift the arm more to adjust. But, uh, be, but because this is a rigid parallel gripper, you can only, the, the, the kinematic chain between the object and the arm is, uh, and the any factor is fixed, so you can only change the arm to reorient, but uh, that will like uh, lift a lot, a, a, a large a, a large angle on the arm. But instead, if you have a dexterous hand, you can just do in-hand orientation to very easily um, reorient, just like human hand. I don't need to adjust my whole arm, I just need to adjust my fingers. Gotcha, awesome, thank you. Our next speaker um, is Gianluca Monacci, um, and he is going to present a paper called DIPCAN, Distilling Privileged Information nope, for Crowd-Aware Navigation. Thank you. Uh, so this is a joint work with my colleagues, Michel Aractinji and Tommy Silander from uh, uh, Never Labs Europe in uh, France. And, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the main motivation for this work is to uh, enable robots to navigate in dynamic crowds to deliver services to humans. And as you see here in this picture, some of these robots already exist and operate services, like in our headquarter in Seoul, but that's not a scene that you see very often, actually. And there are a number of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is that, indeed, the algorithms that are used these days are uh, still uh, falling a little bit short to achieve these tasks. So traditional approaches, the couple, let's say motion people prediction, people motion prediction, sorry, uh, from robot motion planning, and this leads to well-known undesired behaviors, for example, reciprocal dance phenomena or the freezing robot problem. Uh, more recently, there has been developed methods that are based on deep learning that jointly predict crowd motion and plan uh, robot actions. However, these methods assume to have a view like this one on the right, where you have precise tracking of pedestrians in simulated scenes. And as we all know, to have this information accurately from, on, on a robot platform is very hard. Uh, you either need some expensive wide field of view leader and complex and brittle tracking algorithms, and potentially you are still not there. So the intuition be beside, behind this work is to actually, let's say, it's to observe that we, we probably do not need to track precisely pedestrians. Uh, that's not how we do that, actually, how has human uh, navigate uh, through a crowd. 
And uh, this introduces, as we said, a lot of complexity in terms of computation and hardware requirements. And also it might be suboptimal in the sense of the system perspective because um, you might have estimation errors in these algorithms that propagate downstream to downstream tasks in ways that are unknown. So the key idea here is to learn a low dimensional embedding that models these crowd dynamics and contains only the information that is needed uh, for the policy that controls the, the robot. This is potentially a simpler problem and we hope to introduce some robustness at invariance through this dimensionality reduction. So how we go to do that, we propose a two-step approach where we first learn to project some privileged pedestrian motion information that is available in a simulation to a, this low dimensional embedding the, that is then used by a policy that is trained jointly with this projection. And then in the second step, we learn to reconstruct this embedding space from non-privileged information, image data in this case. Now, to ground this in a concrete problem, as I said, we are going to look at the point goal navigation task in a crowded environment where we used a differential drive locobot to achieve that that has embedded RGBD uh, sensing and can sense its, own, its odometry. And we are also going to be equipped with a simulator, a PyBullet-based like Gibson simulation environment in this case, where we can procedurally generate uh, scenes with all sorts of moving pedestrians uh, with different characteristics. And we randomize all these characteristics that include the different type of motion, static, pseudo-random, or ORCA for optimal reciprocal collision avoidance, uh, the, the level of cooperation of the pedestrians with the robot, how many uh, pedestrians are static or moving, and so on. So this is an example of what this uh, simulator looks like. Um, so, to come back to the core of the method, the first step is that we want to learn the, using this privileged information in simulation. So we have non-privileged information like odometry available both here and to the robot, but we also have privileged information, exact pedestrian position at every point in time. And we, what we want to do is that we use uh, these uh, information to jointly train a policy and an encoder using reinforcement learning. Now, the, we do that using PPO and the curriculum on the pedestrian density. And it's important to notice here that indeed this encoder only models the low dimensional vector Z that is useful uh, to the policy since they are jointly trained. Now in the second step, we also extract some non -pre we freeze the network that you trained before, and then we, can, we also extract non-privileged information. For example, here, history of depth images. And then since we are in simulation, we train an adaptation network that model these uh, embedding ZT using supervised learning. We have both of these informations. Um, now, the interesting part that I would like to underline here is that this design is modular, so you can have different adaptation networks for existing policy and encoder combinations. Uh, and here in this work, we developed uh, two variants, one which we call DeepCAN-D, based on depth images, and one which we call the DeepCAN-Y, based on YOLO people detections. And just to mention a small trick here, we use modalities that have a smaller simulation to real gap compared to raw RGB to hope to transfer better to a real robot. And then at deployment, we can just use the policy and the adaptation network that you just trained and only exploit uh, non-privileged information, images and odometry in this case. Now, how does this work? Here I have an example in a, in a simulation with about 30 pedestrians. Sorry, the robot is here at the bottom. I don't know if you see it well, it's a bit dark. And you see that it learns some interesting behavior where it nudges his way through this crowd and pushes it a bit and comes back a little bit and manages to get to the goal, which is the red uh, cylinder at the end. This is a quite challenging scenario to achieve with this narrow field of view camera, of course. Uh, here, just a few more examples in uh, settings where you have a static crowds on the left, uh, randomly moving crowds that do not perceive the robot, in fact, so they are not cooperating to the robot and could stumble into it. And on the right, again, these uh, orca policies. And here, a simple example uh, with a real robot. So here, the, the crowd is still quite dense. Uh, it's, a, it's a much smaller room. What the, and uh, you see that the robot still manages to get to the goal, which is this red cross down here. Now, the interesting thing about this video, which is maybe not so impressive, is that uh, is using the exact same policy of, uh, that we have just trained. There is no, absolutely no adaptation, it's just transferred to the robot. And I think this shows uh, nicely the robustness of the method with this dimensionality reduction through the uh, embedding space. Um, a couple of uh, slides about quantitative results. 
So we compare to a number of baselines. One is, a, let's say, an oracle, which we call DeepCan P, because it uses privileged information. This is an architecture that is comparable with the, the, the deep learning-based methods that I mentioned in the first slide, where we assume exact pedestrian position uh, available. The second one is our beloved uh, dynamic window approach that I think most people working on robot navigation know. Uh, and then we have two learned methods, what, we call, what I call here Recon D, which basically uses the, 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 the architecture trained in the first, uh, let's say, learning step with privileged information, and then in the second learning step, instead of learning the embedding, it just, let's say, it simply learns to reconstruct the privileged information from non-privileged information. So it uses depth or uh, people detection to try to reconstruct the exact position of people at every moment in time. And the last one is, a, it's, I would say, a prototypical end-to-end -end approach, where, uh, which is trained in one uh, pass, uh, which, has the same, uh, uh, which has the same structure of the proposed, uh, our proposed architecture, but is trained just in one pass using non-privileged information. And the results, uh, here it's quite of a big table. I, I will just go through the lines uh, briefly. Uh, it compares uh, the, these methods on uh, scenarios with an average of 10, 20, and 30 pedestrians, and on uh, uh, scores such as success rate, the success rate weighted by time length, the personal space compliance, how much the robot doesn't bother uh, people or doesn't go too close to people, let's say, and the collision rate. And uh, what, what I want to highlight here is that our proposed method uh, it has strong performances across the board and has very limited degradation with respect to the Oracle policy. Um, interestingly, we, we see some properties of the algorithms that we might expect actually from, the, from their design. So DWA is very careful. It doesn't collide a lot with people, but it often freezes, especially in complex scenarios here on the right. Uh, Recon D that reconstructs the privilege, that tries to reconstruct the privileged information from the privileged one has, is, has significant in, inferior performance to DeepCan and it also has a high collision rate and we might speculate that this is because of these estimation errors uh, that, that he encounters. And uh, finally the end-to-end -end method uh, performs a little bit better but still significantly worse than DeepCan. So to conclude, um, I have presented a new model to bridge the gap between this tri uh, crowd trajectory prediction and robot control, and we have achieved, I think, encouraging results in simulation and in the robot platform. And in terms of perspectives, as you might have noticed, uh, we don't have obstacles, inter uh, static obstacles and rooms layout, so we we are working to integrate this model into a kind of mixture of expert kind of approach where we include a planner uh, that we, when we couple with the planner and then we want to test this in real uh, service robots. This is a picture that I took last month in our headquarters in Seoul where a bunch of these robots, about 50, are already delivering coffee from a well-known American brand <laughs> to, to our employees and uh, for the moment there is not a lot of people because of uh, COVID still but I think there will be large crowds and there will be a nice test bed to test this algorithm. And with these I conclude. I welcome you to come to my poster. You have to climb up to the second or third floor I guess uh, <laughs> to, to see me or check the website for more videos and material uh, or contact me. Thanks. Oh. All right. Thank you very much. Do we have questions for our speaker? Uh, thank you for great work. Uh, I have one question. As the policy was trained with model-free reinforcement learning with function approximation, wasn't there any uh, limitation of the policy limi limited to a reactive policy rather than long horizon planning? Like, for example, people when people like uh, plan for long horizon to uh, avoid uh, like dynamic obstacles coming toward them like these things. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure <laughs> I, I understood everything you are. We were asking if the policy is purely reactive or if it's trying to predict. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure I understood the, oh, the question. Yeah, I, thought, I think that's what I want to say. Yeah, so the one that, uh, the policy that we learn it, uh, in the encoder, it, it, uh, it uses one of these uh, trajectory prediction models that has been developed recently in the literature, and so it has a component of prediction 
uh, in terms of what's going to happen. Then I think altogether, when looking at the behavior, it looks a, li a little bit like a balance. It's trying to uh, understand through its action what, what is going to happen around it, uh, around the robot, and it's trying a little bit to predict and a little bit to react. I have the, we have the impression it's a little bit of a combination of it. We uh, did some probing experiments that are not really in the paper where we can see that this uh, embedding vector represents, uh, is, is able to predict uh, better than uh, other types of representations the future position of the robots, of the nearby pedestrians. So there is some of this information uh, in, that, in that embedding. Uh, then, yeah, it, uh, with uh, these reinforcement learning methods, it's not always completely uh, obvious to, to interpret exactly what, what, is, what is used and what is not. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Sure, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it, very interesting work. Um, I'm wondering if you compared to simpler methods that um, don't necessarily use learning, like uh, just an MPC method that samples trajectories at every time step and picks the best. So we, I, we compared with uh, DWA, which is uh, uh, to some extent, uh, let's say, which is related. So with the dynamic window approach, I, I guess you are uh, familiar with it, so you sample, you predict a number of uh, feasible points in, you, in, the, in the dynamic window of the, you know, in the, according to what is your current state, and then it predicts a number of possible trajectories and maximize and picks the one that minimize the chance to collide and uh, gets you closer to the, to the goal. So that would be, let's say, the comparison that we did with uh, in terms of uh, uh, non-learning based uh, approaches. This is the standard, uh, DWA is, for example, is the standard uh, uh, local uh, policy for uh, for the ROS navigation stack. So, right. The, yeah, the reason I ask is I'm wondering in an environment uh, with people that are moving so randomly or chaotically, uh, I wonder how useful it is to actually mm -hmm. think so hard about where the people are versus just wait for them to get out of the way. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, I mean, that's also the whole reason why we didn't want to predict uh, the the position of people indeed. It, I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to exactly predict the position of, the position of people. You want to get uh, an under, you know, a rough understanding of what is the situation in front of you and how dynamic it is and how these people are roughly moving to take an informed decision without having to exactly think too hard about uh, where, they, uh, where they exactly are indeed. So I think, I agree with you, I think it's not really necessary to think so hard about where these people are and they are going, but you would still want to have an indication to make an informed decision of where you would like to go. And that's what we, uh, what, what we hope and we think we are capturing with this embedding. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, uh, really interesting work, and thank you especially for showing an actual robot going through a dense crowd of pedestrians. Um, one of the questions I have, so like, I. I when I see work like this, I immediately think of that little mouse robot from Star Wars that's weaving through the crowd. And one of the things that we've encountered in our own work in, in moving through dense crowds is this problem where you stop, the robot has to stop, right? Because its predictive model has presumably been, been incorrect about something. Uh, and that, that can limit which kinds of robots you can apply this work to potentially, right? And so mm -hmm. first question is, have you thought about applying this to something like a, you know, Ackerman steering vehicle where uh, if you just stop, you, know, you might get yourself into a situation you can't easily get out of? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> and, and, and so, um, and the, 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 the sort of follow up with this is, why do you think um, the model was incorrect in some of these cases where the robot did get stuck and like what can we do to uh, like, improve upon that so what, what we, when the robot got stuck is of course when the crowd is very dense uh, in our case it tries to is very patient at trying to push for example people around to see if they are cooperative or it can backtrack and try to backtrack and then it's also where you get uh, collisions uh, in fact that I didn't she I didn't show here so that's where we have you have the failure case, I think the, 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 the best option in those cases, and this is some of the heuristics that we use in the real services, is to start to, yeah, you stop essentially. That's the, the easiest when you really are, um, you know, it can become dangerous to try to push or backtrack too much, and that's what we do is that we stop, in fact, Great, thank in, you. in the real robot. Thanks. Thank you. I'm sorry, Ruben, I have to cut us off. <laughs> thank you so much. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.
Our third speaker is Alex Ocean, uh, who will be presenting a talk entitled Parameterized Differential Dynamic Programming. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Alex Ocean. I'm a PhD student at Georgia Tech and also a part-time research engineer at NASA Langley Research Center. And I'm excited to share with you our work on parameterized differential dynamic programming. And so our team is really excited about this emerging sector of aviation known as urban air mobility, or UAM. And these UAM vehicles are unique in that they exhibit three distinct phases of flight. They have vertical takeoff and landing capabilities. They can fly like a more traditional fixed wing aircraft. And there's a transition phase between the two. And so UAM is projected to be up to a $28.3 billion industry by 2030. And it has the capacity to revolutionize transportation in cities through the use of air taxis, efficient robotic cargo transportation, and more. To achieve scalability, we need to be able to fly these vehicles autonomously, but this presents numerous challenges for a potential path planning algorithm. And so some of these initial challenges include, we'd like our planner to have some principal guarantees on the trajectories that it generates. We need these trajectories to be very accurate to the dynamics. Our planner should be able to account for any epistemic uncertainty in our model. It needs to be able to handle this multimodality aspect of UAM vehicles. And it should be generalizable to different vehicles, which may have vastly different dynamics. And so there are, of course, many existing path planning algorithms out there, but we choose to focus on one in particular due to its nice properties. And that's differential dynamic programming, or DDP. And so DDP starts with a trajectory. It performs a backward pass to calculate the optimal controls, U star, and then performs a forward pass using the new controls to generate a new trajectory, and the process is repeated. And so one of the nice properties of DDP is that it converges quadratically to a minimum, meaning that after just a few iterations, we can find a low cost solution. Furthermore, this forward pass process uses the full nonlinear dynamics to integrate the state forward, meaning that any trajectory that DDP generates is accurate to what the vehicle can feasibly perform. And while past extensions of DDP explicitly address stochasticity, parametric uncertainty, non-parametric uncertainty, and more, these methods are either not generalizable, they may require very problem-specific parameters, or they require some offline learning component. And so in this work, we're proposing a method that has a general parameterization that naturally generalizes to different tasks and systems. It co-optimizes for the controls and the parameters simultaneously. And it's able to handle this multimodality aspect of UAM vehicles. And so our algorithm is a generalization of DDP DDP starts, DDP solves a standard optimal control problem using dynamic programming and a second order approximation to derive an efficient algorithm for calculating the optimal controls. Our method, which we title parameterized differential dynamic programming, or PDDP, starts by parameterizing the optimal control problem with this vector of parameters theta that's highlighted in red here. And so the role of theta is task dependent. And much like standard DDP, we'll use dynamic programming and a second order approximation to not only calculate the optimal controls U star, but also to calculate the optimal parameters theta star. And so for dynamic programming, we'll use the value function, which is now parameterized by theta, but we're still able to adopt a nice recursive structure to the problem, which you see here. Combining this with the second order approximation allows us to derive a set of backwards pass equations. And these equations, when you solve them backwards in time, 
they give you a quadratic approximation of your value function along, along your trajectory. And so highlighted in red are the additional terms that PDDP needs to compute compared to standard DDP. Using these backwards pass equations, we can derive an optimal control update and an optimal parameter update. And proposition one in our paper shows that this optimal parameter update is actually a Newton's method step for minimizing the value function at the initial time, so at the starting point of your trajectory. Finally, we can apply these updates iteratively in an algorithm until convergence, and theorem one of our paper shows that the convergence is independent of your initialization of your controls or parameters. So no matter where you start, you're guaranteed to find a minimum. And so this general parameterization not only allows PDDP to solve standard optimal control tasks, but it enables the solving adaptive control and time optimal control tasks. It allows for optimization of multimodal systems, including UAM vehicles. And in terms of future directions, we see PDDP being applicable to model-based reinforcement learning, inverse optimal control, and more. But this work specifically will focus on adaptive control and time optimal control for multimodal systems. And so two applications that we present are on adaptive model predictive control, or adaptive MPC, and switching time optimization. For adaptive MPC, we use a combined cost function where minimizing the first term solves a moving horizon estimation problem that maximizes the likelihood of your previously observed states. Minimizing the second term solves a model predictive control task that allows us to plan a future trajectory. And so we test our method on three systems of increasing complexity, a carp pull, quad rotor, and an ant quadruped. Starting with the carp pull, here you see our adaptive MPC algorithm using PDDP to estimate the pole mass of the carp pull while simultaneously bringing it to the upright position. And in just under 50 steps of our algorithm, we're able to converge to the true pole mass while simultaneously solving the problem. Likewise, on the right here, you see the quad rotor. And we apply our adaptive MPC algorithm to estimate not just the mass of the quad rotor, but also the diagonal inertia components while simultaneously attempting to reach the target state denoted by the red dot. And so in just a few iterations of our algorithm, we're able to converge to the true model parameters. Finally, we use the ant as a sort of demonstrative comparison of our algorithm. So on the left here, you see DDP planning a trajectory using a model that doesn't match reality. So the leg lengths are very long. If we were to apply this planned trajectory on the true model, it would result in failure, where the ant is about to tip over. But if we use our adaptive MPC algorithm with PDDP, we're able to successfully estimate the true leg lengths of the system while simultaneously driving the ant forward using this jumping gait. And remarkably, in just two optimization steps, we're able to converge to the true model parameters. So those were some results on adaptive MPC. Now we'll move on to switching time optimization, where we'll consider a multimodal system where the dynamics pass through n modes. We'll augment it into this switching time system through a discretization and an introduction of this parameter theta i that determines the terminal time of each of your modes. And so once again, we test on three systems, a carp pole, quad rotor, and NASA lift plus cruise vehicle. So starting with the quad rotor on the left here, you can see a converged solution found by PDDP where the modes are determined by the target state. So the first mode of the dynamics actually has a target state on the left with an X position of minus five and the pole in the upright position. And the second mode has a target state on the right with an X position of five and the pole in the upright position. And so you can see that PDDP has found a time optimal control to reach these two targets sequentially. 
on the right here, you see a similar setup to the quad rotor, where our goal is to reach a first target state and then a second target state. And because we've explicitly introduced the terminal time of each mode as an optimization parameter, this avoids the need to manually tune the time horizon of our problem. Finally, we'll print then as a result on the NASA Lift Plus Cruise UAM vehicle. And so the goal here is to perform a vertical takeoff to 200 feet and then transition into forward flight. So note that the transition point wasn't manually specified. It was found by our algorithm. So I'll replay it. So we can successfully reach the target altitude before transitioning into forward flight, which is invaluable for flying these vehicles in cities. And so in conclusion, our algorithm PDDP is a second order of algorithm derived by extending classical optimal control. It has principal convergence guarantees. It co-optimizes for the controls and parameters simultaneously. It generalizes to multiple tasks, and it enables time op optimal trajectory planning for multimodal systems, including UAM vehicles. So thank you for your time. Uh, visit our poster session today at 4 p.m. Questions for our speaker, go ahead. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering with the uh, adaptive MPC, um, experiment, you have this combined um, estimation and like optimal, like optima, optimal control problem. How do you stop it um, being kind of like optimistic about the parameters, like choosing parameters that would uh, make your problem easier? Yeah, that's a good question. So the moving horizon estimation portion is only over past states that we've already seen. Yeah, but for example, you might want to, as in, if your um, dynamics are a function of the parameters, for example, you might, or are sure. you not oh, using okay. gradients of, of the parameters with respect to the... Yeah, I think I understand what you mean. So the, the planning portion doesn't incorporate the parameters and the cost. Okay. Does that make sense? So you wouldn't use any gradients for... for... Yeah, exactly. Okay, all right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hi, right, thanks for the great work. So I'm curious as to um, if there are any conditions on the observability of the parameters um, in order for your method to actually converge. Uh, assumptions on what, sorry? On the observability of the parameters theta over time. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by exertability. Observability. Oh, sorry, observability. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the parameters actually don't have to be observable at all. Um, so. For instance, in that scenario where we're estimating the pole mass or the inertia components of the quad rotor, um, we don't observe any of the, these parameters. We only observe a set of states, and then we're able to estimate what the parameters should be given what states we've seen. Does that make sense? Sure, thanks. Yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker one more time. Our final speaker of this session is Weijia Chen, and he'll be presenting a paper titled AK, Attentive Kernel for Information Gathering. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, my name is Weijia Chen. We present AK, Attentive Kernel for Information Gathering. This is a joint work with Ronnie Carlin and Lan Taoliu. So why do we care about robotic information gathering? Robots collect mapping information to navigate in unknown environments. Robot arms actively localize the object for contact-rich manipulation. Dynamics information of the physical robot helps seem to real transfer. In these applications, information gathering is a necessary auxiliary task. In some other scenarios, information gathering itself is the main goal of the task. For example, 3D reconstruction, 
elevation mapping, environmental monitoring. In this work, we focus more on the active learning or sensing problems, but our approach can also be applied to the first category. So what is robotic information gathering? This is a system diagram showing how it works. The robot perceives the environment and uses the collected data to build the probabilistic model that not only gives us the prediction of the environment, but also the uncertainty of its prediction. The uncertainty can be used to calculate the objective function for the downstream planner that guides the robot to collect the next batch of valuable data for building an accurate model. Many existing work in robotic information gathering focus on developing planners. In this work, we, we would like to emphasize that the probabilistic model is also very important, especially the uncertainty quantification aspect. Many existing work use Gaussian process regression as the probabilistic model. Gaussian process regression gives us the prediction and uncertainty based on the correlation among data points. The correlation between two data points, x and x prime, is characterized by the kernel function k, which is further controlled by a hyperparameter length scale, here denoted by L. We will visualize the L at the upper right corner and give the digital representation of length scale at the lower right. Intuitively, a small length scale gives us a weakly function while a large length scale gives us a smooth function. Commonly used kernels like the RBF kernel we've seen in the previous slides are stationary kernels. Stationary kernels are not good enough. There are two problems. First, stationary kernel has only one single global length scale parameter that controls the, controls the variability of the target function. We assume that the environment has the same variability everywhere, which is not typically not true in a real environment. For example, in this volcano environment, we have a, large, a higher variability in the central part. Due to this mismatch, we will, we will see a higher modeling error in the center. The second problem is that stationary kernel assigns higher uncertainty to the unexplored area rather than the high error area or complex area. This problem is even worse when, than having a high error because now we cannot reduce the error by minimizing uncertainty. As a comparison, if we use a non-stationary kernel as the attentive kernel we will introduce later, we can capture more environmental features. And we have smaller modeling error. Most importantly, we'll assign higher uncertainty to the complex area. This is a side-by-side -side comparison between using a stationary kernel and a non-stationary kernel in robotic information gathering. We can see that on the left-hand side, the stationary kernel guides the robot to explore the environment uniformly ignoring the fact that we have a higher error to the right. As a comparison, non-stationary kernel gives higher uncertainty to the right, so the robot collects more informative data or valuable data there. If we look at the prediction and ground truth map, the non-stationary kernel gives us a better prediction that is closer to the um, ground truth than the stationary kernel. I hope everyone is motivated as me to design a non-stationary kernel for robotic information gathering. First, we identified that there are two types of non-stationarity. The first one is called variable length scale. Uh, this is demonstrated by this toy function. In the middle part, we can see there is a weekly function where we need a small length scale to model it. And we need large length scale for a, a, anywhere else because they're pretty smooth. The second type of non-stationarity is the sharp changes around the transitions. Let's first look at why stationary kernel fail in this case. If we use a small length scale, we are not able to model this smooth part if we don't have dense data. And also we have a high error at the sharp transition because we use a small length scale, which assumes that the data points are not highly correlated. If we use the large length scale, we cannot model the weakening part, and we smooth out the transition. So how the uh, attentive kernel handles these problems? For the variable length scale, we propose similarity attention where we learn a weighting function that can adaptively combine different base kernels with fixed, uh, prefixed length scales. Our key observation is that after normalization, um, the, the data typically has a, a typical range of length scale where we can build some primitive base kernel and then combine them together later. Here is the learned uh, W vector for each input. We can see that for the middle part, we select the small length scale and for other area, we select large length scale so that we can model this function better than the previous result. But we still cannot model the sharp transition. 
which leads us to the second idea, which is called visibility attention, where we learn a membership function Z and use the inner product to mask out the correlation, no matter how large or how small their, their land scale is. Here's the learn Z function of attentive kernel. We can see that we select different membership for the two sides of the sharp tra transition so that we can model this part pretty well. Although I presented in this simple way, the attentive kernel is actually extracted from this generative model called AKGPR. This compared to the stationary kernel or other, uh, the standard Gaussian process regression, this model gives us a better uncertainty quantification. We can see that a high uncertainty is assigned to the complex area. Applying this to the robotic information gathering problem, we can have better uncertainty, better objective function for the planner. We've conducted experiments in four environments with different characteristics, and uh, we compared to two leading non-stationary kernels and a stationary baseline under five evaluation metrics. Um, attentive kernel consistently outperforms these uh, competitors. We've also tried different sampling strategies. Sensitivity analysis shows that the attentive kernel is robust to the number of base kernels, the hidden units, and the range of primitive land scales. Evolution study shows that similar similarity attention contributes more than visibility attention. And finally, uh, overfitting analysis shows that attentive kernel is more robust than others, but uh, we think the regularization method is still needed for training non-stationary kernels. We've conducted the real-world experiment in this quarry lake where we hope the robot can collect more samples in the interesting area at the lower left corner and upper right corner. Uh, you can quite see it on this Google map, but I have swam in this lake. So at the lower left, there is a rocky area, and the upper right, there is a large stone platform, so which has the sharp transition. This is the system. We have IMU and GPS for localization, and a downward-facing sonar for collecting the depth me uh, measurement. The robot first collects information or circling around the environment to get a sense of the environment. And then it starts focusing on this lower left complex area because the attentive kernel assigns higher uncertainty there, just like the volcano case. I'll show the map building process in the uh, next slide where the bottom part is the prediction and the upper part is the uh, uncertainty map. Oops. Um. The robot keeps chasing an informative waypoint uh, and while collecting data. After effectively reduced uncertainty at the lower left, the robot starts exploring the environment. Here we discover another interesting spot and build the map. Here we can see that we capture these two environmental features autonomously. To wrap it up, we emphasize the uncertainty quantification of probabilistic model is important for robotic information gathering. We propose attentive kernel, which is similarity attention and visibility attention to provide better uncertainty for information gathering. We've done field experiments showing that the robot is able to identify essential sampling locations and collect more valuable data. We provide a code for all the figures, animations, and results, and more videos can be found here. We also open source the software called Papolo, which is for informative planning and uncertainty aware learning. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready to take any question. Questions for our speaker? Go ahead. So this is really good work. I have tried to struggle with this problem of heteroscedasticity, and you, you get the failure you exactly point at, which is you don't get the hard boundaries between the different kernels. So I just want to say, that's, I think that's great. It's a nice solution. What do you do when you actually don't know the membership? You have a point, and it lies halfway between the support of all your previous points, and you can't tell whether which GP to associate it to. Which uh, membership? Um, you mean? So you have some new point, and you're going to do inference, between, and it lies halfway between. So you have, say, a bunch of points from one GP and a bunch of points from another GP, yeah. and you've associated them. And now you have one point that lies right in the middle between the two. And so it's not clear which GP it belongs to. How do you handle that in terms of the inference there? Oh, actually, uh, for, the, for the weighting function and the membership function, we use a soft relaxation. So we, we have a soft assignment for those points. It's not a hard uh, partition. I see. Yeah. So and do you weight the output of the two GPs according to the weight of the soft assignment? Um, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's pro proportionally assigned to uh, different uh, Gaussian processes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So I'll ask a question. Um, this is really interesting and not in my area, but um, is there a way of including prior information, so adding priors to the system that would allow the information gathering to focus on specific areas? Yeah, great question. So um, we actually have another ISS work uh, proposing a multi-objective planner for doing this um, multi-objective sampling where you can inject your prior information about the environment. Um, for this task, um, the, the robot just sampled the environment autonomously, so uh, we can only inject prior information in the kernel function where we can provide how smooth, the, uh, provide knowledge of how smooth the environment is to the Gaussian process regression. Um, if we want to focus on some specific area, I think we need to define another objective function and do multi-objective uh, sampling. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. One more question? Yeah, uh, this is a very interesting talk, and uh, I can see it's following kind of like a next best viewpoint strategy. Uh, would like to hear your comments or thoughts on uh, how easy is it to extend to multiple targets or more complex uh, targets? Uh, do you mean by more complex, do you mean high dimensional data? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, well, about we have tried uh, running this kernel on some UCI dimen uh, high dimensional data sets. Um, it's also uh, better than the, the Gibbs kernel and the, non uh, and the deep kernel learning uh, non-stationary kernels. So we have uh, already extended that um, to high dimensional. Oh, great. Looking forward to that. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Let's thank our speaker.